My name is Larry Lannon. It's Tom Stallhut. It's Charisma McMurray. Speech Night winner of 1985. 1994, so about a million years ago. And the topic of my speech was, is there a need? Illiteracy is a human tragedy. The importance of organ donation. Let's take a stand, make a change. IUPUI pride. It gives us these opportunities to share our messages with the world. And the power one has in being an effective communicator. She taught me how to use my voice. It is of paramount importance because no matter what you decide to do after graduation, you can be decent at a lot of other things. It's crucial to society's functioning. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's not how you die, but how you live. It's not what you gain, but what you give. With a clear and uniform voice, maybe we can strike out malaria and better the world one person at a time. There just comes a time when you have to stand up for your rights, and you have to stand up for what you believe, and you have to stand up for what's right. I looked at him and I said, is this a typical lunch for you? Now imagine if you're looking up to see what it was you had done, what you had hit with your car. Have gone against the grain realizing that, hey, maybe there are some of us who look human. Maybe there are some of us who eat breakfast. Maybe there are some people we are trying to sell these products to that care that they don't look like this. Until one day, the smiles on these young girls' faces turned from genuine happiness to a facade created to hide the pain from the truth. And despite whether or not something is true when someone tells you so many times, you start to believe it. My name is Larry Lannon. I won speech night in the fall of 1973. I gave a presentation on the Electoral College. I look back on the skills that I learned during my college years as a non-traditional college student, acquiring the skill of speaking before a group of people may be one of the most important. Okay, guys. Just a matter of a few minutes, and let me tell you, it goes quick. You're gonna stand right here where I am, and everybody's gonna be watching your every movement. My name is Tom Stallhut. I am your 1979 IUPUI speech contest winner. The speech I gave was titled, Let the Deaf Boy Swim. It focused on the importance of not setting limitations on others due to their perceived obstacles. I have appreciated what I learned during that speech C-110 for two reasons. Communicating during my 38 years of teaching with parents, students, faculty members, community members has been utilized. I've used those skills. But the most important thing that I appreciate in that speech class was there was a real cute blonde who sat next to me and I used the persuasive skills that you taught me and I talked her into marrying me. So tonight, I would simply like to ask you to care. I wanna help you to be conscious of the magnitude of the problem. I would like to show you that attempts have been made to correct the situations. I would like to give you some reasons why you should care and I would like to ask for your effort. Good evening. I'm Dorothy Easterly, Speech Night winner of 1985. Congratulations to those of you who are participating in tonight's event. Speech class is one of the most important classes on this campus. The title of my speech was, Will You Care? My speech was to encourage my audience to be more compassionate toward people with physical disabilities. Winning gave me confidence in what I had to say, improved my ability to connect with my audience, and ultimately helped me make intelligent contributions in many speaking situations. But perhaps the most significant contribution for me that spring semester is that I was given very important tools to use in my chosen career, teaching. Hello, I'm Tyrone Folks. I'm a priest in the Episcopal Church, 
and I was the winner of Speech Night in the spring of 1991 with my speech, Illiteracy is a Human Tragedy. That was 30 years ago, and since then I've come to really appreciate how that night still informs my current work as a member of the clergy and as a thought leader in faith and spirituality, in justice work, and in the arts. Today, we should all be grateful for the power of words and for the power of speech, and for the right and freedom to have a position and publicly speak our truth. Hello, my name is Alicia Coulmont, and I won the Speech Night Contest in 1994, so about a million years ago and the topic was uh, American welfare reform. And that was really a pivotal point uh, in my education because I really had been very shy and doing speeches was something that was very foreign to me. So uh, that really helped me uh, determine that speech was really important and it wasn't just about presentations, but it's so applicable to pretty much any job that you have uh, in the future. Um, it's important to be able to express yourself and be articulate um, no matter what field you go into. Laying the flowers at the base of the stone, Elizabeth gently traces the words etched in marble. Nancy Jo Livingston, 1955-1995. I'm Debbie Campbell. I was the winner of the spring 1996 speech night. The topic of my speech was not one more. I focused on the increasing numbers of younger women diagnosed with breast cancer. In fact, I myself am a beneficiary of 3D mammography. Five years ago, I was diagnosed with stage zero breast cancer. The imaging found it early, thus saving my life. As a registered nurse, I know the importance of effective communication. It is of paramount importance in talking with the patient, the family, and all of the caregivers. This holds true in every aspect of life. My brother and I went mountain biking a few months ago, and after a few hours we stopped to have something to eat, and I stared in disbelief as he popped open a beer, inhaled a package of Twinkies, and lit up a cigarette. Hi. My name is Carla Childers, and it's my privilege to be speaking to all of you on this occasion of the IUPUI Speech Communications 100th Speech Night Competition. I was the winner of Speech Night all the way back in the fall of 1999. The name of my speech was, How Long Do You Want to Live? And having just turned 50 this week, I can tell you that my answer to this question continues to be a whole lot longer. Um, but then as I listened to my younger self, I was really transported back to that class and that semester and could see in my delivery so many of the lessons I still carry with me to this day. And I've always been grateful that I had that foundational experience of learning what it takes to be an effective speaker and the power one has in being an effective communicator. Hi, I'm Stephanie Ertle and I won the 2001 speech competition at IUPUI. Uh, the topic of my speech was the importance of organ donation. Um, I was very passionate about that topic and I still am um, due to how many lives can be saved thanks to organ donation. Um, communication is vital, especially this day and age when we are missing out on some of those face-to-face -face conversations that we can have with people um, due to the pandemic. Um, but communicating, whether it be, you know, phone conversations or Zoom calls or um, utilizing technology to make sure our communication is clear and that our message is being received the way that it is intended um, could not be more important. Somebody, when nobody did what anybody could have done. Whose responsibility is it? Is it? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's not how you die, but how you live. It's not what you gain, but what you give. These are the measures to merit the worth of a man or a woman, regardless of birth. 
Hello everybody, my name is Corey Allen Duncan Sr. Um, I was the speech night champion in fall 2003, and the topic of my speech was, is there a need? Very important to me, and all of my life, I have been a communicator. That God has blessed me to be the senior pastor of the City of Hope Community Church located right here in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana, where I get the opportunity every single Sunday to communicate uh, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've served as an assistant chaplain uh, for the Indiana Pacers. Um, I've been the chaplain at Warren Central High School for the football program there. I've been the co-host of a radio show, Stand Out uh, 365, and I've written a number of different um, uh, posts and blogs and essays and so communication is my entire life and I'm grateful and thankful for the opportunity to participate in Speech Night 2003 and for the foundation that I received at IUPUI as it relates to communication. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. My two older brothers Rick and Rodney and I stood into way of our home and watched them tear as our dad threw plates, silverware and glasses at our mom. My oldest brother took Rick and Rodney, or my oldest brother Rick took Rodney into his room, while our dad continued to beat our mom so badly that to this day she can still only turn her head so far away. Hey everybody, my name is Reagan Stewen, and I was the Fall 2005 Speech Night Award winner. First, I want to congratulate all of tonight's participants. It really is an honor to be a part of this event, and I know it can be nerve-wracking, but I hope that you enjoy it and embrace it. The title of my speech was Take a Stand, Make a Change, and it was a call to action speech for the audience to donate time or resources to the Julian Center, which is a domestic violence shelter for women and children in Indianapolis. The topic was really personal for me, and I was really nervous about speaking to it in front of the audience, but also felt really empowered and grateful for the opportunity to do so. And then, of course, as I was graduating from college or even applying for competitive internships, to be able to include this really unique differentiator in my resume and as I was interviewing, I think really set me apart and gave me a lot of confidence about what I could bring to the table. Now, as a sophomore here, I often ask myself why? Why if there's so many students like you and I on this campus do not take more time to enjoy all the things that this campus serves to offer us? For those of you that feel there's no outlet for you to get involved, Hi, my name is Ben Colston. I am the spring 2009 winner of IUPUI Speech Night. I won with the speech topic, IUPUI Pride. Speech Night for me was a validation of my oral communication skills. And honestly, winning Speech Night is one of the things that kept me in pursuit of my bachelor's degree. Communication is so important in the world we live in today, both for our personal relationships and for our professional relationships. Effective communication is one of the keys to professional success and also personal happiness. I wanna thank IUPUI and its faculty and staff for teaching me these and so many other life lessons. Go Jags. Last November, while attending Ball State University, I decided last minute to go out on a Friday night with some friends. I had drank before, just occasionally. That night though, something went wrong. After a few drinks, I stopped paying attention to how many I was having. The rest of the night was pretty much blurred, with the exception of being woken up by paramedics with flashlights in a dark dorm room and being strapped down to their stretcher against my will. My name is Samantha Stanish, and I participated in IUPUI's 2012 speech night. I actually ended up winning that night, which was so unexpected and crazy, but such a wonderful experience. Um, I don't think I had won anything before that, and so it was really felt kind of surreal to, to win something, especially based on me, me speaking and talking and something based on my own story. Um, the title of my speech was called Sobering Thoughts, <clears throat> which was I wrote about the problem of binge drinking in college and how dangerous it can be. And I based it on a very personal experience that had happened shortly before that. Um, that's really what I learned the most from that night was just it is 
you can make your mess your message and put it out there and start that conversation for other people, even if it's uncomfortable, because sometimes just ripping off the band-aid and someone else saying something first can kind of make other people say, oh yeah, me too. It's easier to say me too than to say, hey, it, does anyone else experience this or feel like this? But with just one simple signature, you can help to end the revolving door of crime. Hi, my name is Allison Keir, and I am the 2013 Speech Night Champion. The title of my speech was Education Behind Bars, a Win-Win for Society. Speech Night was such an amazing, incredible, and honestly terrifying opportunity. Even though it was eight years ago, I can still remember the butterflies that I felt before I took the stage. But honestly, it was a once in a lifetime experience to speak about something that I'm really passionate about. Communication to me is important because no matter what you decide to do after graduation or what industry you decide to pursue, having really great communication skills can take you far. Thank you so much IEPY for this opportunity. These girls were being abused not only physically, but mentally. They were being called whores and sluts and told that they were worthless. And despite whether or not something is true when someone tells you so many times, you start to believe it. Hi, my name is Jalicia Bell, and I am the winner of Speech Night Spring 2014. The title of my speech was what to do, where to go, who to call. So that's why speech uh, and communication are so important because it gives us these opportunities to share our messages with the world and um, give people knowledge that they might not have had if we had not come in contact. We live in a society whose growing narcissism is ever present. A society whose growing narcissism is leading to a compassion rate that's continually shrinking. Howdy folks, my name is Connor LaGrange and I was the spring 2015 speech night winner with a speech entitled Unlearn to Relearn, diving into how maybe listening could potentially solve our society's narcissism problems. I'd love to say that that speech was a wild success and society's narcissism problem has been solved, but I think I would be lying if I said that. To me, communication is of the utmost importance. Whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a trash truck driver, you communicate with people every day. So understanding the nuances of communication, and how to get your ideas and your arguments across in the public square via public speaking is crucial to society's functioning. At the age of five, I fell victim to child molestation. At the age of 12, it was me who was discriminated against by my school and my family. And at the age of 16, it was my father who was waving that gun around in my face. So, I, Nathaniel Burton, was under the teachings of Jennifer Metcalf back in the year of 2017, the spring to be exact, and she is a phenomenal teacher. She is nothing short of the best, and I'm forever grateful. She taught me how to use my voice, speaking for my passion, with my passion, and about my passion, with a greater purpose, and effectively communicating that. And that is what Speech Night is all about. I was passionate about so many things back then, but the one that ruled over them all was oppression, and so I spoke my winning speech was freedom from oppression speech night is more than just a competition or a grade it's an opportunity for you to stand on that stage and use your voice and use it the way that you see fit hi my name's charisma <laughs> and you're watching disney channel Hi, my name is Charisma McMurray and I am a senior here at IUPUI, majoring in psychology with two minors in English and Africana studies. And I am the 2008 Speech Night winner. My speech was titled Monopoly the Disney Edition. And communication is such an important skill to have. My mother always raised me to believe that no one can introduce you like yourself. So never mess up on that and never let anyone else introduce you. And that's just because the communication is so key. And that's why we all need to develop that skill because there are going to be times where we can't rely on someone else to introduce us or to explain projects that we're working on, just explain our own passions. So the importance of communication is to really articulate to the world and to your family and your friends who you are, what you're doing, and where you're going.
So what else can I say except you're welcome. We will be a people so full of ourselves that we have no capacity to serve others. So is police brutality a problem? Again, I believe so. One, two, three. Now just relax, because I'm about to lay something real heavy on all of y'all. Hello, and welcome to the 100th Speech Night Competition. My name is Ahmed Abdullah and my speech was called Putting the Right People Behind Bars. And I am Rana Amin, and we will be your MCs for this historic event. We were contestants of the 99th Speech Night and Curtis Memorial Contest last semester. I gave a speech entitled Ending Prejudice Against Muslim Women. As the COVID-19 pandemic comes to an end, the team behind this year's Speech Night competition wanted to do their best to still provide an enjoyable and interactive Speech Night competition. Our team recognizes the difficulty in holding an event like this one online and have done our best to make this virtual speech night as short and sweet as possible while still incorporating all of the elements of a traditional speech night competition. So let's get started. The first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Christine Kernick, Chair of Communication Studies here at IPY. Dr. Kernick is always a huge supporter of the IPY Speakers Lab in the biannual speech night competition. Her support and emphasis on the importance of communication is always inspiring. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kernick. Good evening, everyone. I wanna take this opportunity to welcome all of you, scholars, friends, parents, colleagues, and guests to the 100th biannual speech night competition. This is truly a momentous occasion the Department of Communication Studies has held this event continually at the end of each fall and spring semester for the past 50 years. Over those years, we have heard wonderful and thoughtful speeches on a wide variety of topics at the forefront of social discourse. Tonight promises to be more of the same, an evening of great oratory. Author and aviator Anne Morrow Lindbergh once wrote, quote, Good communication is as stimulating as black coffee and just as hard to sleep after. I hope and expect that at the end of this competition, you'll be able to experience that sentiment. A little about speech night. This is the longest continually running event on the IUPUI campus. You're about to hear seven of the best speeches created this fall. And to add to this excitement, you, get to participate in the evaluation process. A great deal rides on the decisions you will make as you listen to these speakers. The winner of tonight's competition takes home not only a beautiful trophy, bragging rights, and a nice resume line, but also a cash prize of $1,500. So listen carefully and choose wisely. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank the people who have made this night possible. First, your instructors. Thank you to all of our wonderful R110 instructors. Your efforts are truly and genuinely appreciated. Next, thank you to the R110 leadership team who keep the course running smoothly each year by coordinating roughly 140 sections and 4,000 students and who have made this evening possible. First, course director Steve Overby and assistant course director Ian Sheeler. Thank you both. And finally, I want to thank and commend you, scholars, R110 students, for making a valuable investment in your future by completing this course. Engaging in smart, clear, informed oral communication is a gift that you will use throughout your lives. The skills you've acquired will help you professionally regardless of your major. However, for those of you who have not yet committed to a major, I have just two words for you, communication studies. A communication studies degree can provide you with the knowledge and set of skills that are critical to organizations and transferable between organizations and even careers. Don't believe me? Look at sought-after majors and skills listed in Indeed and Career Builder. I guarantee you'll be surprised at how often you'll see communication studies. 
Another possibility you may want to consider is the new, new BA in applied theater, film, and television. If you have an interest in either theater, film, and television studies, or production, I'm happy to announce this new degree in the School of Liberal Arts, which will give you a great start in these fields. On the other hand, even if you have already chosen a major that is not communication studies, I urge you to consider one of our six minors, including organization and corporate communication, media arts and production, health communication, persuasion, and even theater. If you look up soft skills that employers look for in potential employees on Monster.com, you'll see that number one on their list is communication. Both written and verbal communication skills are, quote, in their words, of the utmost importance in the workplace because they set the tone for how people perceive you. They also improve your chances of building relationships with coworkers, end quote. And further, quote, workers are more productive when they know how to communicate with their peers. If you can clearly express the who, what, when, where, why, and how of a project, you'll be a hot ticket, end quote. And their advice on how to gain that skill? Take public speaking. So don't pack away what you've learned this semester. Keep this material close by. Remember what a good introduction looks like, what it should accomplish. Remember how an oral argument should be structured, how to transition between points, and how to summarize for the listener so that they know what to take away from your words. You've been provided a great framework through which to communicate your ideas when you leave here and leave the university. Use it. You'll be glad you did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kernick. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tamil Idol, Dean of the Indiana University School of Liberal Arts here at IPY. While relatively new to IPY, Dr. Idol has shown strength and incredible leadership in the midst of a COVID-19 impact on our beloved campus. Welcome, Dr. Idol. Welcome to the 100th Speech Night Competition. My name is Tamala Idol, and I am privileged to serve as Dean of the IU School of Liberal Arts. Today, you join a legacy of 50 years of R110 students who, over the semester, learn to be more effective and persuasive speakers on topics that they care about. Effective speaking is a skill that you can continue to cultivate, and it will serve you well no matter what you study or what career you pursue. What I hear from students today is that they want to be a part of positive change. They want to be a part of solutions. The challenges that they care about include wicked problems like human trafficking, climate change, sustainability, poverty, racial inequities, homelessness, and pandemics, to name just a few. You have persisted with your education despite the challenges of a global pandemic. And I want you to take a second to reflect on your journey this year. Congratulate yourself. It may not have been the year that you planned on, but you are near the end and you persisted. You might also want to thank those you have depended on for encouragement. And as you focus on your final exams, be a friend and reach out to a peer who you think could use a kind word. Relationships and interaction matter to us. They nurture us and make us stronger and more resilient. Remember that it's okay not to be okay. This year has been challenging for all of us. While our experiences have been different, most of us have awakened at some point this past year feeling overwhelmed. I know I have. As we think about what is needed to get to the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic, we recognize that the solutions to problems, like a global pandemic, require innovation and expertise from various fields. Virologists, MDs, epidemiologists, public health officials are essential but addressing the pandemic and implementing solutions also requires liberal arts expertise about the human condition, inequality, history, politics, ethics, communication, and more. 
The liberal arts help you develop knowledge about a range of important subjects, current events, and social issues. The liberal arts challenge you to be open to the perspectives of those whose experiences differ from your own or whom you may disagree. The liberal arts encourage curiosity that will help you live an enriched and fulfilling life in addition to building knowledge and skills that make you stand out among other applicants as you apply for your first job or your fifth job. I want each of you to know that you have an opportunity to explore a second degree in the School of Liberal Arts. Have you heard about the Liberal Arts Dual Degree Program? As you are completing a first degree, you can complete a second degree in the Liberal Arts. Most Liberal Arts degrees require 11 courses, and most students, regardless of their degree program, can add a Liberal Arts degree without adding additional semesters of study. So you can earn a second degree without additional cost or time in college. If you study one of the health professions, imagine adding a second degree in medical humanities, creative writing, or economics. Imagine adding a second degree in communication studies, sociology, or religious studies if you study psychology or neuroscience. If you study engineering, we encourage you to explore one of our dual degrees with French, German, or Spanish. If you study earth or environmental science, how about a second degree in geography, anthropology, or political science? The potential combinations are endless, and a liberal arts advisor is ready to talk to you about what you are passionate about and help you chart your course towards a dual degree in four years. Now, on to the main event. Like many of you, this is my first year at IUPUI and my first speech night. I am anxious to watch and learn. Welcome again to the 100th speech night. Thank you, Dr. Karnick and Dr. Idol. Now we would like to take some time to tell you about an amazing opportunity here at IUPUI. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie, and I work in the IUPUI Speakers Lab. Not only am I getting my master's in applied communication, but I'm majoring in communication studies and English literature with a minor in Spanish. So I know liberal arts are extremely important, especially in our world today. A liberal arts perspective on storytelling, diversity and inclusion, and culture and health not only look fabulous on your academic resume, but also benefit you as you pursue your passions. Whether you're a liberal arts major or not, nothing needs to stop you from getting a minor in one of those areas. To complete undergrad requirements, you already must take COM R110 and English W131, and those would count directly towards your Pathways minor in liberal arts. You need electives to complete your degree, and what better way than to take them in these important areas to add a minor to your diploma? With just three more courses, you'll be on your way to a pathway minor. You can choose from a wide range of options, such as writing fiction, global health, or women's studies. Director Rachel Wheeler explains the pathway minor program in this short video. Hello, my name is Rachel Wheeler. I'm a professor of religious studies and director of the new Pathway Minors program in the School of Liberal Arts. Here in Liberal Arts, our courses dive straight into key questions and issues facing our society today. Our faculty are committed to fostering the vital skills of critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication through the study of history, literature, religion, philosophy, sociology, and more. Pathway Minors allow you to apply these liberal arts skills to enhance your chosen path of study. Each of our Pathway Minors is a 15 credit course of study centered around a common theme that complements a wide range of majors across IUPUI's campus. The Pathway Minor in Culture and Health offers an array of courses exploring health and healing from multiple perspectives in varied cultural contexts, preparing you with essential skills for any health-oriented career. Storytelling is at the heart of the human experience, from sacred texts to great works of literature, from newspapers to podcasts, and even Instagram. 
The Pathway Minor in Storytelling invites you to explore the ways that stories are made, told, shaped, and produced across cultures, including your own. The Pathway Minor in Diversity and Inclusion explores the multiple components of identity, including race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, class, age, and disability, and how these identities shape and are shaped by societal structures. All of the Pathway Miners let you bring the power of the liberal arts along with you as you chart the path to your future, wherever that may take you. If you'd like to find out more, explore our website, check out our videos, and feel free to reach me via email. There is a Canvas that you can be added to if you are interested in this. Just three classes to get you a minor no matter what school you're in. Be sure to ask your advisor and visit the website to see if you can get on the pathway to storytelling, diversity and inclusion, or culture and health. I hope to see you on the path. We are now going to review the judging and voting process before we introduce our first speaker. You can locate the digital judging sheet by clicking on the button below the video. This sheet can be used to help you keep track of the scores of the contestants and help you select the winner. On the screen now is the judging sheet. Please follow along as I review how to fill it out. On this form, there is a place for you to score each contestant on a variety of categories, including the proper Monroe motivated sequence format, citations, and speech delivery. We ask that you score fairly and objectively. As this is an unusual way to host a speech contest, we ask that you take into account not only the quality of the videos, but also what the speaker is saying and how evident it is that they have practiced and prepared. After you have watched all seven speeches, a Serving Monkey link and QR code will be displayed on the screen. At this time, you will vote by ranking the contestants from first to seventh place. Let's meet the 100th biannual speech night contestants. Our first speaker of this evening is Isaiah Hill. He's majoring in biology. His instructor is Professor Day, and the title of the speech is Police Reform. Police, ordinary people, just like you and me who have taken upon the job to protect and serve our fellow citizens. And when the police come around, we should have an overall sense of comfort and protection, regardless of our age, our race, our gender, or even our sexuality. So why is it that I have a sense of uneasiness whenever the police do come around? If you're part of the minority, you may also have the same feeling. But even if you aren't, it's not hard for you to see how differently people are treated just by the colors of our skin. Growing up, my mother didn't allow me to do a lot of things. However, one of those things was I could never play with any type of toy gun, no matter how much I asked. She didn't care if it was a toy nerf gun or even a toy water gun. Why did she do this, you may ask? This was due to the 2014 case of Tremere Rice. And for those of you who don't know, Tremere Rice was a 12-year-old little boy. Yes, 12 years old, whole life ahead of him when he was shot and killed by the police. He was outside playing with his toy gun when the police mistaken it for a real one. This case, one of many cases and one of many reasons of why our current police system needs to change. We need to adopt new practices as demonstrated by other countries due to our constant unnecessary violence and killing going on. So why is this a problem you may ask? Well, if the death of a 12 year old is not enough for you, allow me to break it down to you. With the current practices in place, unnecessary killings are happening. And these killings are often racially motivated. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and say people of color are the only people that are victims of this, because this is not true. And even to set race aside for a moment, we cannot allow the police to play judge, jury, and executioner on whoever they may believe. According to the Washington Post, police kill roughly 1,000 people every single year. And to do the math on that, that's roughly two to three people killed every single day. Now, this graph here by Washington Post shows the rates in which different races are killed by the police. And as you can see, white is third to Hispanic and African-American. And one misconception that I often, often hear is that white Americans are killed more than African-Americans. However, people forget to, to take into account the overall US population in which white Americans take up roughly 197 million compared to the only 42 million of African-Americans. This goes to show how the rate of African-Americans is more than twice that of those of white Americans. Another reason why this is a problem because we literally see people get away with murder. Is entitled murder. And I say this because according to Lucent Hop with the BBC News, police officers are favored by judges in court. And even if they get charged, they get charged with lesser offenses than the ones they originally committed. Not even to mention, according to the New York Times, since 2005, only 121 officers were arrested on charges of manslaughter or murder. And of those cases, only 95 of those cases were concluded. And of the 95, only 44 were convicted. 
Most of them of a lesser charge, by the way. Not even to mention the officers that only get fired or paid leave. That's basically like a slap on the hand. Oh, take this paid leave and think about your actions. No, we need to take a human life more seriously. And we need to charge people for the crimes that they commit regardless of their occupation. Now that you see what the problem is at hand, what can we do to change this, to solve this, to look for a better future? And one of these reasons, one of these ways is increase the police officer training. And with increased trainings, police officers will have more experiences and more time to deal with their weapons and certain scenarios that they aren't familiar with. And this quote from Time is, says that Rhode Island requires 22 weeks of basic law training compared to the minimum of 11 by Georgia. However, when compared to a barber who needs more than 37 work weeks to even qualify for the license in the same state, why is it that a barber requires more time than someone who is out armed enforcing the law? And when the worst a barber can do is mess up your hair, this, this is gonna grow back eventually. You know, that may take a, a little while, maybe like weeks, maybe a couple months. However, in all seriousness, the worst a police officer can do is take a human life. Another way we can do this is change our current practices. If we change our current practices, we won't have to worry about the things that are in place. However, for example, trigger warning ahead. This one, the one we saw last year, the knee on neck restraint that we saw in George Floyd's case. According to Berger, this is banned in most of Europe, and you can see why your face is in the pavement and a knee is in your neck. Not even to mention how long he was on his neck for. Roughly nine minutes, by the way. This is honestly look like something the police needs to have at their disposal when enforcing the law. Or how about another one? The no-knock warrant, which we also saw last year in Breonna Taylor's case. And in Breonna Taylor's case, this happened in the middle of the night, roughly 12 a.m. And when somebody busts in your house, your first reaction is to protect yourself and your family. So I don't know why people get surprised when police officers are shot when breaking into someone's home. According to Berger, this is also not a part of routine law enforcement in Iceland or Norway. And this is why. Now, if we implement these changes now, we can, we can look at a bright future. I genuinely believe we can bring a sense of unity, not only between citizens and police, but also between races. Now, I'm not gonna sit up here and say that this is a cure to racism or anything, but race definitely plays a part. And once we implement these changes, people will be more trusting of police. I know I would for sure. I wouldn't think twice about interacting with the police if I knew I didn't have to fear the current standards and practices in place. Not to mention if they're gonna do their job properly regardless of my skin color. However, if we do not implement these changes, we're unfortunately gonna look at something that happened last year, the George Floyd riots all across the country. And this, this was only from George Floyd. And if we continue this, who knows what else will happen? Because minorities are tired of fighting for things by peaceful means, because this isn't anything new. What is the difference between these two pictures? 1963 to, to present. The only difference is the color. We're still fighting for the same things. We are tired of doing the same thing over and over again. We need the justice and equality that we deserve. Now, here's what you can do. Now, if you have any human decency or any care for equality or justice, true justice, you can do this just by going to change.org and create an account. Once you have an account, it, I promise you it's super quick. And once you create an account, signing petitions is just a click of a button. Or if you want to take it a step further, you can write to someone in our local Congress, congressional district and to tell them our concerns. And now I'm not saying that these changes are going to happen overnight. However, change is a process that happens over time. And the sooner we act, the sooner we begin to see those changes. As it stands right now, our current police system needs to change due to a constant, unnecessary violence and killing. And we need to take practices from other countries and implement them into our own. And with this, I genuinely believe that we can bring a sense of unity. Thank you. Our second speaker of the evening is Raiden Sia Genron. He is majoring in electrical engineering and his instructor is Professor Hart. The title of his speech is Bidets, Not a Crappy Idea. Does anyone remember the great toilet paper panic of May 2020? I remember back last year when people first started hoarding toilet paper. 
I was one of the unlucky ones and one day I found myself having run out. Out of desperation, I decided to use some old newspapers that I had lying around and boy those times were rough. Okay, crappy jokes aside, believe it or not, our love for tissue products directly contributes to climate change, biodiversity loss, and disruption of indigenous communities. As someone with a keen interest in sustainability, I've conducted extensive research into this topic, and this is what I shall present today. I'll be talking about why there is an urgent need to address our usage of tissue products, propose a simple solution to this otherwise shitty situation, and suggest a few actions that you can take to make a difference, one sheet of toilet paper at a time. Globally, Americans use the most amount of toilet paper per capita. According to the Statista Consumer Market Outlook, the average American used 12.7 kilograms or 56.4 rolls of toilet paper in the year 2018. Normally, I'd say that whatever one wishes to do in the privacy of their own bathrooms should be their own darn business. But there is a real need to address the issue with tissue. According to a report published by the National Resources Defense Council titled The Issue with Tissue 2.0, How to Treat the Toilet Pipeline Fuels Our Climate Crisis, Canada's boreal forests feed much of the U.S.'s demand for tissue products. According to BC Stats and Statistics Canada, the U.S. accounted for 56% of all of Canada's pulp and paper exports in the year 2018. Each second, the boreal loses roughly 1,400 square feet from logging, and much of this goes towards the manufacture of tissue products. And this is not even mentioning the statistics associated with logging in the boreal, such as carbon emissions, biodiversity loss, and the disruption of indigenous communities. And in case none of this has managed to convince you that there is a problem, please allow me to address your personal interest. Toilet paper just isn't that hygienic. According to a 2019 study by Wishva Kaskoda published in a Canadian science fair journal, bacterial growth experiments conducted by obtaining swabs from participants' anal regions showed clearly that wiping of toilet paper yielded far more bacterial growth than washing with water or washing with water and soap. But you didn't need a scientific study to come up to that, with come up with that conclusion. Let's all imagine that we are the proud owner of Jake Gyllenhaal's luxurious beard. Now, say I were to take a jar of peanut butter and smear it into your beard, and here's a roll of toilet paper for you to clean yourself up with. And you can't look in the mirror while you do it. Do you think you do a very good job of cleaning yourself up? Now that we've talked about why there is an urgent need to address our overzealous usage of tissue products, let's talk about a simple solution that could address this problem head on. Enter the bidet. From the humble handheld bidet that is ubiquitous in Southeast Asia and the Arab world, to the luxurious remote controlled tushy warming total wash that's more common in Japan, bidets come in many shapes and sizes. According to bidet manufacturer Bondel, a bidet requires an average of, 20, of only 20 ounces of water per usage. Assuming you poop once a day, this comes out to only 57 gallons of water per year, which happens to be 10 times less than is required to produce the same amount of toilet paper for the same function. And let's not forget that the manufacture and usage of a bidet requires exactly zero trees. In terms of hygiene, bidets are far superior to toilet paper. According to rectal surgeon Dr. Evan Goldstein, using a bidet is the ideal way to care for your backside after using the bathroom. Like the peanut butter, an like the peanut butter anecdote, using toilet paper essentially smears your fecal matter around without properly cleaning the area. Please, allow me to use this meme to illustrate my point. So, now that we've heard about the benefits of using a bidet, let's take a brief moment to visualize what the world would look like if Americans switched to using bidets. Using the paper calculator provided by the Environmental Paper Network, by switching to bidets, Americans could save 169.29 billion gallons of water per year. This is enough water to fill 256,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. 
by switching to bidets, Americans would also be saving 9.24 billion trees from being cut down each year, or taking the equivalent of 9.96 million cars off the roads by not manufacturing tissue products. And in terms of personal gain, we're looking at average individual savings of $182 per year. That's enough to buy almost three entire Fundamentals of Speech Communications textbooks. Truly a worthy cause. And of course, nothing beats the peace of mind that you get from knowing that your backside is truly clean after all the business is done. Now, I understand that some of you may still be reluctant to make the switch to using a bidet for good. So for the bidet curious out there, here are some questions that you may be wondering. How much does it cost to install a bidet? Well, standard bidet seat attachments can go for as low as $30 on Amazon. I understand that some of you may not be willing to shell out this amount of money, or perhaps the thought of having to deal with plumbing or housing regulations may scare you off. Therefore, I suggest that a suitable alternative could be as simple as buying one of these babies. A portable handheld bidet can be bought off Amazon or at Walmart for as little as $5. I promise you that once you try one, you can't go back. Now the next question that you may be wondering is, well, how do I dry myself off after using a bidet? Well, I must admit, even though I am personally a long time bidet user, I still use a couple squares of toilet paper to dry off after each usage. It's not something that I'm proud of. Alternatively, you could dry yourself off using a towel the same way you would after a shower. And if none of this has managed to convince you, please at least consider being more responsible with which tissue products you choose to purchase. This scorecard put together by the NRDC ranks the various tissue products in terms of their level of sustainability. And here's a link for you to share this scorecard with your friends and family. In conclusion, today we've talked about how our usage of tissue products is harming the environment, why bidets might be a simple solution to a shitty situation, and simple actions that we can take to make a difference one sheet of toilet paper at a time. I hope that moving forward, we can all play our part in preserving our environment before our forests are all but wiped out. Thank you. Our third speaker of the evening is Zen Hong Tan. He is majoring in electrical engineering. His instructor is Professor Burdett, and the title of the speech is Voicing Out for the International Asian Community. Before I embarked on my journey as a student in the United States, my friend who is a senior here in IUPUI told me that your life in the United States will not be complete if you did not receive racist comments about your culture. I did not believe them by then, but sadly, they are right. If you go around and survey every single international Asian student in IUPUI, I'm certain that most of them have the experience of being discriminated against because of their physical features, religion, as well as skin color. I am Tan, and I am your tiny, Asian, and nerdish friend. And as part of the Asian community, I experienced Asian hate right here in IUPUI, and I had read a lot about it. Thus, I feel that there is a need for me to address to this situation. Today, I will be talking about the need to reduce hate towards the international Asian community right here in IUPUI, what can we do, and how it will impact the IUPUI community. IUPUI might not be as racial tolerant as it seems to portray itself. I would like to share some of my personal experience. Throughout my three months as a student in IUPUI, I had received racist comments by some strangers about my culture, not once, not twice, but thrice when I was just walking around campus. The comments include 
using the F word on Asians and even go back to your home country. I re-examined myself and I came to one conclusion. On the three occasions I was receiving those comments, I dressed like this, just like how any typical Chinese will dress themselves. Now, I dress myself like this, just to look more like part of the American community and to avoid racism towards myself. Somehow, I did not receive any of those comments in the past month. It is sad to say, but I must dress like a typical American to avoid racism. To aggravate this situation, the recent rise of Asian hate has also worried us as international Asian students. According to NBC News, Asian hate crimes has increased by nearly 150%, mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic and trade war. I understand that there is a long history about Asian hate, but that does not mean that we should do nothing about it. Now that we understand about the issue of Asian hate, let us move on to what the IUPUI community can do. There are many new policies that IUPUI can implement to reduce the rate of racism towards international students. Before I move on any further, let me give credit to the noble efforts that IUPUI made. According to the IUPUI Division of Diversity, Equity, and inclusion website, the IUPUI administration clearly states that they reject all words, actions, and deeds of racism. Besides, allow me to quote from the Vice Chancellor of International Affairs, IUPUI. She says that IUPUI will not ever waver in our commitment to our global inclusive campus and community. These noble efforts should be continued, and we should make it clear that IUPUI rejects all forms of racism. IUPUI should also implement an Asian Awareness Week to let the students know that hate towards Asians is very much a thing. According to Katie Lang, an Asian rights activist in her article in Times, Policing is not the best way to solve Asian hate as it only instills fear among those haters and it failed to remove their hate. Instead, we should start off right here in IUPUI to educate our students on what harm racism does to the community. According to the UNESCO official webpage, education is always the key to solve racism. A few statements by the IUPUI administration are just not enough to educate the community as compared to an Asian Awareness Week. In this Awareness Week, we can invite Asian rights activists to deliver their thoughts on this matter. I am also very willing to share what it means to be an Asian to the community. I have now laid out the potential steps that IUPUI can do, and now I will proceed to the main question on why we should do it. Everyone in the IOPI community will benefit from a zero hate environment. With the introduction of an Asian Awareness Week, IOPI will be a more conducive environment. I hope that one day I am free to wear any shirt I like without the fear of receiving racist comments. I hope that one day I will not tell my juniors that their life as an international student will not be complete without receiving any racial comments. I hope that one day everyone in the world will live harmoniously with one another despite their differences in race and culture. Without us taking this very first step, America will never be completely free from hate crimes. This is where we start as a member of the IUPUI community. Scan on the QR code and click 
on the Call Me In button in the IUPUI Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion webpage to keep yourself updated. Indulge yourself more in clubs and societies of a different culture and they are all available on this spot, IUPUI. Now that I have enlightened you on the hardships faced by Asian students like me, how the IOPUI community can act to reduce the effects of this issue as well as the positive outcomes of a racist-free community, I hope that everyone can act. When everyone understands each other better, we will be able to join hands and sing in one voice. We are many, but we are one. Thank you. Our fourth speaker of the evening is Autumn Barker. She is a sophomore majoring in pre-nursing and her instructor is Professor David. The title of her speech is The Collective Corruption. Picture an average college student. The first thing she does in the morning is scroll through her Instagram feed. As she gets ready for class, she gets several more notifications and every time she hears the familiar buzz, she gets super excited and checks it right away. Over the course of the day, she will look at her phone a total of 192 times. Now, how many of you could see yourself in that student's shoes as I told that story? How many of you felt like you couldn't relate to her because you could never check a phone that much? Well, if you can relate to that story, maybe you can relate to this statistic. According to a study done at Asurion, a global tech care company, Americans will check their phones on average 96 times a day, and 18 to 24 year olds check their phones twice as much as the national average. To some, this may seem like a harmless act. However, the grim reality is that most people in today's world are addicted to their cell phones and especially to their social media. I myself, an 18-year-old college student, am not a stranger to the habit-forming platforms that are plaguing our lives. However, I have done research and I have found ways to help stop it from consuming the way that I live my life. Social media is negatively impacting our lives, from our mental health to our personal relationships, and even the way that we think and act. And today I'm going to show you how to minimize these effects and the benefits of reducing your use of social media. To start, let's define what social media is. As defined by Merriam-Webster, social media is forms of electronic communication through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content such as videos. In a survey conducted in my R110 class, 100% of the participants, 100% said that they have social media accounts, and over 58% said that they had six or more social media platforms that they use. The problem with social media is not that all of the content is inherently bad, but that using these platforms is highly addictive. In a study done at Harvard University, the effects of social media on the pleasure centers of our brain were tested and the results showed that just by using social media, our brain is hyperstimulated, which causes a release of dopamine. This is known as the feel-good hormone, but if released too often, our brain and body will crave it, just like a drug addict will crave crack cocaine. During this pandemic, we've all felt the sadness that comes from the lack of human contact. However, Social media is causing our personal relationships to be in jeopardy even without a pandemic because we are voluntarily on our phones instead of being with other people in many situations. In a Netflix documentary titled The Social Dilemma, Tristan Harris, a former Google designer, talks about the effects that these platforms can have on us. He says we have a digital pacifier for ourselves that is atrophying our ability to deal with uncomfortable situations. And helpguide.org says interacting with social media only denies you the face-to-face -face interaction that can help ease anxiety in social situations. What this means is that social media is only hurting us worse when we use it as a crutch for social anxiety. Not only does turning to our social media affect our personal relationships, but it also has a huge impact on our mental health. The Center for Mental Health.org.uk says that the evidence suggests that social media use is strongly associated with anxiety, loneliness, and depression, and that FOMO, or the fear of missing out, has been linked to intensive social media use and is associated with lower mood and life satisfaction. This means that young people are feeling anxious and worried about their appearances more than ever before because we have limitless opportunities to compare ourselves with others. And as Theodore Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. These platforms are comprised of complicated algorithms that adapt to show us things that may interest us based on our previous online interactions. 
As Roger McNamee, early investor in Facebook, said in an interview, it's like 2.7 billion Truman shows. Each person has their own reality with their own facts, facts that are being fed directly to us by an outside source without opposition. This can lead us to changing our ideas and becoming focused only on what is placed in front of us. So just imagine the debilitating impact that this is having on our current political tolerance and opinions. Having this information fed to us is even decreasing our attention spans. Taken directly from MyTutor.UK, an education blog, Lady Greenfield, who is an Oxford professor of synaptic pharmacology, argues that social media risks infantilizing the human mind. So now that I've informed you on how social media can be harmful to our lives, let me show you some ways to change and reduce how you use these platforms. There are several ways to reduce your use of social media. The first and easiest step in changing is turning off your notifications to these apps. The buzz is what was providing the college student with her hit of dopamine, which kept her coming back to the phone. So turning these off will force you to make the mindful choice to log onto an app instead of getting distracted by a notification. Another simple thing you can do is put a time limit on yourself. In your phone settings, you can access a time restriction icon and you can then set the time limit for any amount of time you see fit. And when you have used up your time, your phone will tell you and the app will go dark. But the most effective way to reduce your use of social media is to participate in a social media fast. Fasting means to go without. So essentially you are purposefully not accessing these apps for a defined period of time. Deleting these apps for a week or even four will not delete your accounts. So when you feel ready to access the online world again, it will be waiting for you. I recognize that this may seem difficult or uncomfortable for many people. I know because I've done it with my church. At first, I felt very scared to delete these apps, but I was supported by those who were doing it around me. Getting someone to participate in these activities with you can help you be successful. Now, let me show you the benefits of using these methods. Your use of technology will become more like a tool instead of an enabler for addiction. These apps are not all bad and can be used for good as long as we use them mindfully and understand how they can impact us. Jeremy Anderberg writes in a men's blog about his experience with a four week social media fast. He says, I am now far more intent on using my phone for thoughtful, purposeful actions rather than letting it control how I use my time. Your anxiety and stress levels will decrease. When I participated in the fast the first time, within a few days of not looking at any of my apps, my self-esteem was dramatically higher because I wasn't constantly comparing myself to others. In a study done at the University of Pennsylvania, the lead study author, Melissa G. Hunt, said that using less social media than you normally would leads to significant decreases of depression and loneliness. Today, I showed you how social media is negatively impacting our mental health, our personal relationships, and even the way that we think. But I also showed you ways to help you change your use of social media and the benefits of doing so. I hope that this speech was able to help you understand the desperate need for us to change the way that we use these online tools. Right now, take out your cell phone, choose the social media app that we use the most like Instagram or Facebook and turn off all notifications to it. Please take this first easy step in enacting change in your virtual habits. And now think back to the woman at the beginning of this story. That woman was me before I started using these methods to control my social media use. Now I'm one week into another month long fast and I no longer feel lonely or anxious. I can feel myself getting more patient with people and I'm becoming more productive. I even had time to write this speech for competition when I never thought I would have had time before. This will change the way that you think about your social life for the better and allow you the freedom to experience the real world around you. Thank you. Our fifth speaker of the evening is Lillian Smith. She's an exploratory major. Her instructor is Professor Burdett, and the title of her speech is Standardized Testing Where Requirement Laws Should Be Abolished and Tests Should Be Changed. If I were to ask you to give me a list of some of the most stressful experiences from school, you could probably give me a pretty long list. But if I had to guess, you'd probably put somewhere on there the words standardized testing. And just saying the words is enough to fill me with a little bit of dread. My name is Lillian. And in fact, according to the American Test Anxieties Association, over 34% of students in America suffer from moderate to severe test anxiety. And learning this fact led me to research whether or not standardized testing actually has any benefits for students. 
And what I found led me to the conclusion that standardized testing is not always an accurate depiction of what students are learning in schools. And therefore, standardized testing laws should be changed and alternatives to testing should be sought out. Now, if you went to school in the United States, the chances that you took a standardized test are very high because standardized testing is actually required by law in most states, including Indiana. And in 1989, the Phi Delta Kappon magazine did an article describing the main concerns of testing at that point. And there were three main ones, which were that standardized tests created an incorrect picture of the quality in schools, the standardized tests were unfair and biased towards some students, and that standardized tests inevitably took teaching time away from important subjects like higher order thinking. And over 30 years later, these same concerns are still being expressed today. So let's look at each of these concerns. The first concern is that standardized tests create an incorrect picture of the learning quality in schools. And in a McCabe survey of over 70,000 students, 64% of them admitted to cheating on a test at some point. And in 2011, in an ABC News report, they described how a standardized test cheating scandal in Atlanta involved over 150 teachers who changed standardized test scores um, in, of students in their class. And I describe this to you because if students and teachers are reverting to cheating in order to pass tests in their class, then these tests are not giving us an accurate picture of what learning actually looks like in schools today. Now, the second main concern is that standardized tests are unfair and that they are biased towards some students. According to a Forbes article in 2015, when economically challenged students took a test, uh, took the SAT specifically, they were more likely to be at least 37 points behind other students on the reading portion of the SAT. And this was mainly attributed to these students' ability to obtain test prep due to their economic hardships. Additionally, according to the College Board, when the class of 2020 took the SAT, when it came to the math college readiness benchmark, 59% of Asian and white students made the mark, while only 33% of Hispanic and Latinos made the same mark, and only 25% of Black students made this mark. The last concern is that standardized tests inevitably take teaching time away from important subjects like higher order thinking. So, according to the American Federation of Teachers, they found that U.S. schools spend between 19 days and an entire month on test preparation in class every single year. And this doesn't even count for the time when students are spending uh, preparing for tests on their own outside of class. And in addition to take time taken to actually take the tests. Additionally, this uh, survey found that if testing were to be abandoned altogether, classes would gain 20 to 40 minutes of time every single day. Additionally, excessive time spent on testing can take a significant toll on the student's mental health. So with these concerns in mind, should we really be spending as much time and money as we currently are on standardized testing? The conclusion that myself and many others have come to is no, that we should not be spending as much time as we are and as much money as we currently are on standardized testing because it really is not doing what it should be doing. So therefore, standardized testing laws should be changed and alternatives to these tests should be sought out. So there are a number of different alternatives that can be used to change up how we currently are testing students, but the, I want to talk about two main ones today. First one is infrequent testing strategies, and the second is short, low-stakes assessments. So if we are to use infrequent testing strategies, there would be several benefits that would come from this. The first is that it would allow for mental rest for students while still allowing teachers to observe a student's abilities. And additionally, this would give teachers more time to spend teaching college preparatory concepts, which are very important when it comes to higher education learning. The second way to 
to change our testing today would be to utilize short low stakes assessments. And there are several benefits according to the Michigan State University. The first is that it would help metacognition, which is the ability to understand thought processes. And the second is that it improves long-term memory concepts. And it also would help reduce student anxiety. Changing laws to allow for opting out of testing would also help to avoid student burnout when it comes to taking multiple, multiple tests throughout the year. So in order to create better education in America, change must be initiated. And this starts first with us. And this can be in a variety of ways, but there, but starting with conversation is a great way to start. So call, or email or meet with your representatives and your senators to let them know about the problems that occur with standardized testing today in America. And additionally, start conversations with people in your community to let them know about the problems with standardized testing. Standardized testing is a very important part of education today, but unfortunately it is a part that is severely lacking. So therefore it is important that we change standardized testing laws to allow opting out of testing and also change tests as they are currently to different alternatives that have better benefits for students. Oprah Winfrey once said, education is the key to unlocking the world, a passport to freedom. If education is truly the key to unlocking the world, then together we must do everything in our power to hand this key to the next generation and to make it attainable for them. Thank you. Our sixth speaker of the evening is Joshua Ford. He is majoring in health science and his instructor is Professor Zajac. The title of his speech is Helping the System That Heals. Hi everyone, my name is Josh Ford and I'm presenting my question of policy speech titled Helping the System That Heals. Imagine in your time of need, a time when you are sick or injured and need help, that you are not taken seriously, treated unfairly, or judged simply because of who you are. What if in these instances, you might not receive the care that you require? We are all consumers in the healthcare system, whether that be regular checkups, emergency department visits, surgeries, or rehabilitation, from something as simple as getting an antibiotic for an infection, to more serious experiences, such as surgery for a life-threatening illness, everyone deserves the same respect and the same level of care that will provide them with the best outcome. Over the past three years, I have had the opportunity to work in the healthcare system in various settings. I've been involved in many surgeries in the OR, seen countless patients in the ER, and responded to numerous 911 calls on an ambulance. These experiences have illustrated to me that when it comes to health and wellness, Providers must ensure that they are respectful, fair, and educated in order to be able to provide excellent patient care. In these situations, any sort of bias must be rejected by all staff and the patients they encounter so that we do not continue seeing the health disparities that are present today. Implicit bias is present within our healthcare system and is hurting society and the health system as a whole, but steps such as training on recognizing personal implicit bias can be taken to decrease this bias and improve patient outcomes significantly. Addressing implicit bias in healthcare is crucial to improve health equity and patient outcomes. Researchers from the National Institutes of Health define implicit bias as thoughts that often exist outside of conscious awareness. Additionally, they state that negative implicit attitudes about people of color may contribute to racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare. Despite these being unconscious or immediate thoughts, they can still be detrimental to overall interactions, especially between patients and their providers. Implicit bias can be measured through implicit association tests or IATs. These IATs are timed tasks that measure implicit preferences by circumventing conscious processing. Ultimately, these tests will determine whether someone has unconscious preferences towards varying groups of people, particularly based on gender, race, weight, or age. Keir Bridges, a law professor from Boston University, effectively describes the relationship between implicit association tests and the treatment pathologies for minorities in the United States. She found that physicians who IAT tests revealed them to harbor pro-white implicit biases 
we're more likely to prescribe pain medications to white patients than to black patients. This startling information highlights that implicit bias can and will impact treatment plans for millions of people in our country based on factors that they cannot change or control. This reality is unacceptable for our society and no one should have life-saving treatment withheld solely based on the color of their skin. The standard of allowing implicit bias to impact our healthcare system must change and it must change now. To reduce implicit bias, a concept that has been fundamentally proven to diminish patient outcomes and experiences, broad structural changes to society, as well as personal improvements must be made nationwide. Dana Matthew, Director of Health Law at the University of Colorado, notes that fi fixing systemic educational inequality, housing segregation, and the lack of universal health care coverage would go much further toward equalizing health outcomes. These broad structural changes would work to reduce the vicious cycle of implicit bias in society that continues to bleed into the healthcare system today. Another way to reduce implicit bias is to educate providers on recognizing implicit bias and working personally to reduce it within themselves. As examined by physicians from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, most newly minted physicians take the Hippocratic oath vowing to treat all patients as respected individuals. Regardless, disparities in health care persist, and physicians are still not immune to implicit bias because uncertainty and pressure surrounding the diagnostic process may promote reliance on stereotypes for efficient decision making. Because of this, providers on all levels and in all departments must recognize and evaluate their own implicit biases Throughout the education process in becoming a health provider and during continued education in their careers, courses should be held to teach on how one can recognize their personal biases. Additionally, these courses must address the health disparities we face due to implicit bias and how a resolution must begin on an individual level. Although making these systemic and personal changes might seem overwhelming, they will result in extraordinarily positive outcomes in regards to the reformation of the health system. By expelling personal bias from our society, not only can we see refinements within our healthcare system, but we will recognize improvements within our culture as well. According to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, health care organizations can reduce disparities related to a racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, and other factors historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. If st steps are taken by healthcare organizations to become the most inclusive in our country, then a bar can be set to better all resources and programs across the country. By setting this bar, we see increased inclusion as well as decreased stereotyping and bias that currently plagues our everyday lives. In someone's time of need, especially when they are actively seeking help, healthcare systems should ensure that their providers are delivering the most informed and recommended treatments. With this plan in place, we no longer would have to address or worry about CDC statistics, such as African-American women being two to three times more likely to die during childbirth. Ultimately, patient morbidities and mortalities would diminish among all ethnic, religious, and cultural groups, therefore creating a healthier country. While bias is still present in healthcare, we will continue seeing extreme health disparities and inequities that negatively impact the system and every single stakeholder within this system. Despite this, efforts can be made to change both systemic policy as well as personal influences. With a health system that decreases implicit bias present in itself, people can receive more complete treatment and ultimately create a healthier society. Although fixing a billion dollar industry might be complex, changing one person is simple. I encourage you to learn more about implicit bias and how we are influenced by the experiences and the information we receive that feeds this bias. Also, learn how to recognize your own implicit bias. Take IATs and address areas where bias is present. Continue to be an active learner, not just for the healthcare system, but for your neighbor too. As John F. Kennedy wisely said, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. 
I encourage you to take this advice because making a difference today might be what will save a life tomorrow. Thank you. Our final speaker of the evening is Katya Halstead. She is majoring in visual communication design. Her instructor is Professor Craig, and the title of her speech is Healthy Personal Policy. We have been living in a pandemic for over a year now. We've used hand sanitizer, worn masks, stayed six feet apart. We have significantly changed our daily routines for the sake of cleanliness. And living like this has made me look back at how unsanitary our habits were before COVID. Remember how it was in 2019. We didn't wash our hands or use hand sanitizer nearly as much as we do now. We didn't clean our homes or businesses nearly to the extent that we do now. And we used to gather together in large crowds, shoulder to shoulder, breathing in the same recycled air as the stranger next to us. Now, I'm not usually a germaphobe, but living like this for the past year has opened my eyes to how our habits have changed for the better. And it's made me wonder what habits we're doing today that a year from now we'll look back on and realize are unsanitary. It's made me notice our habits towards toothbrush care. And after doing some research, I found habits in my own routine that needed solving and that not everybody knows how to properly care for their toothbrush. This can become a problem for those of you who are unaware of the many contaminants that your toothbrush is at risk of contracting or the easy solutions that can protect them. So today, I'll persuade you to follow this QR code to the United Concordia Dental Health Center's website and use their guidelines for do's and don'ts for basic toothbrush care by convincing you that your toothbrush habits are a problem, but there are easy solutions for a personal policy change and benefits to those solutions. But what exactly is the problem? Our lack of knowledge of basic toothbrush care puts many of us at risk of using contaminated toothbrushes. Contamination can come from many sources that you may not know about, from either using the toothbrush for long periods of time, for not cleaning it properly, or from careless storage of the brush. A study was done by the Journal of International Dental and Medical Research, and they found that roughly 85% of people store their toothbrush in a bathroom with a toilet. It's very common and not an issue in and of itself. However, this fact does become a cause for concern when you look at how many people flush with the toilet seat open. According to my questionnaire, that's roughly 60% of my class and should reflect the views of most IUPUI students. But how does the combination of an open toilet seat and a nearby toothbrush become part of the problem? Well, when you flush, not all of the contents go down the drain like you'd expect. According to Physics of Fluids Journal, the turbulence within the bowl sprays particles, and roughly 40 to 60% of those particles reach above the toilet seat at an upwards velocity of five meters a second. It's basically raining cats and dogs of fecal matter and bacteria all over your bathroom, and this range of particles could easily reach your toothbrush and contaminate it. If that becomes the case, your toothbrush becomes at an increased risk of contracting one or more of these microorganisms found in the same study mentioned before with E. coli at the highest risk of all. And misconceptions are a huge part of these unhealthy toothbrush habits. A misconception of my own was about toothbrush covers. In fact, when I was first writing this speech, I planned to persuade you all to buy some of your own. Toothbrush covers are something you clip over your toothbrush that supposedly protects it from airborne bacteria. I used to use these every day, but after researching sanitary toothbrush policies and searching and searching for a good reason to use these, I couldn't find any. Instead, I only found warning after warning, do not cover your toothbrush. It turns out that covering your toothbrush is the same as wearing a winter coat in summertime. It gets you all hot and musty, and for a toothbrush, that's the perfect environment for bacteria that's already on it from your mouth to worsen. The Journal of Advanced Medical and Dental Sciences has one such article that condemns the usage of toothbrush covers. They say that it is a myth that these accessories help, and they instead create a damp environment that is conducive to the growth of microorganisms. My incidental ignorance put me at risk of using a contaminated toothbrush. And many of you who are also unaware of the basic toothbrush policies are putting yourselves at risk of the same. According to my questionnaire, more than 20% of my class covers their toothbrush. Do you? Because according to the European Journal of Molecular Clinical Medicine, covering your toothbrush contributes to moisture preservation and prevents toothbrushes from drying, allowing microorganisms to shape a so-called self-contained ecosystem. Furthermore, almost half of my class waits long after the recommended three to four month period to replace their toothbrush. 
do you? Because according to the nursing research and practice, contamination of toothbrushes occurs early in life of the brush and tends to increase with repeated use. And lastly, a whopping 65% of my class doesn't take into consideration where their toilet is from their toothbrush. Do you? Because according to New York State Dental Journal, contamination may lead to colonization of microorganisms in the mouth and possibly infection. Now, it seems like there are so many ways to go wrong, it's becoming hard to know how you can protect your toothbrush from the many ways of contamination, but there are solutions. Thankfully, there are guidelines that can educate you on the subject and are proven solutions for protecting toothbrushes. This year, the United Concordia Dental Health Center published a detailed list of do's and don'ts for basic toothbrush care. Some policies on the do's list include replacing your toothbrush every three to four months, rinsing it with tap water to clean, and setting it upright for air drying after use. Some policies on the don't list include don't share your toothbrush, don't place it too close to the toilet, and don't cover it. Because once again, the number of bacteria on toothbrushes stored in room air decrease far more quickly than on brushes in containers, according to nursing research and practice. Now these solutions seem great, but you still might be wondering, why should you bother to change your daily routine just because a website tells you to? What are the benefits? Well, by following my QR code and using their guidelines to create a personal policy change, you'd be not only saving your toothbrush, but you'd be saving your oral health. The same article from Nursing Research and Practice says that for those of you who wait long periods of time before replacing your toothbrush, replacing it every three to four months regularly instead would avoid the continuous growth of microorganisms. And for those of you who place your toothbrush in a bathroom with a toilet, separating the two would prevent particles from a flushing toilet to be able to reach your toothbrush, according to European Journal of Molecular and Clinical Medicine. And as I have said before, those of you who cover your toothbrush, allowing it to stand upright and air dry instead would prevent the creation of a damp environment where microorganisms would thrive. All of these things are something you don't want in your mouth. Because point is, a clean brush equals a clean mouth. By protecting and taking care of your toothbrush, you'd be not only avoiding a possible infection or disease, but really bad breath. In conclusion, this year we've learned that there are many ways to contract a disease and get sick, but your toothbrush should not be one of them. Our lack of knowledge on toothbrush care has become a problem, but there are easy solutions that benefit us all. So I urge you to use this QR code to the United Concordia Dental Health Center's website and use their do and don't guidelines to create a healthy personal policy. And I know that in a year, our standard for cleanliness will be just as high as it is to us now, keeping each other, ourselves, and even our toothbrushes clean and safe. What a wonderful group of speakers we have. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, it's time to vote. Voting for the 100th Biannual Speech Night will be open from May 3rd to May 7th and can be reached by scanning this QR code or by typing this link into your browser. This link will allow you one vote per person, so use it wisely. The winner and finalist placement will be announced next week, so be sure to check back to the speakerslab.info in a few days. From everyone here at IUPUI Speakers Lab, and the team behind this semester's speech night. Thank you so much for your participation in this amazing event. We couldn't do it without people like you, and we can't wait to announce the winner after voting has been closed. Good luck to all of the contestants, and thank you all for watching.